Well, good morning, community. Uh, welcome to our Sunday morning service here uh, virtually. Uh, to open our service this morning, uh, we're going to read a call to worship from Psalm 33, verses 6 through 9. So if you would, follow along with me as I read. It says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. This morning we lift our voices to worship the one who has put the worlds and the galaxies in motion and upholds them by his own power. Our God is the creator of the universe, and he sustains us with that same power that he sustains the universe. So let's lift our voices and praise our all-powerful, almighty God this morning. All creatures of our God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Oh, praise Him Alleluia Thou burning sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with softer gleam Oh, praise Him Oh, praise Him by his blood come and rejoice in his great love oh praise him alleluia Christ has defeated every sin cast all your burdens now on him
This is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. It says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And this morning, I don't know what your anxieties might be, but I do know that we serve a God who is large enough and strong enough to handle them. So right now, uh, if you would press pause on the video and take your prayers and your anxieties and your concerns and your burdens and cast them on your God who cares for you and has demonstrated that by sending his son to the cross to die for you. So press pause, uh, make your requests known to God, and then come, come back and join us on the video. Well, for those of us who bring our burdens before the Lord, we are met in heaven with a great high priest, Jesus Christ, the one who died for us and the one who is now our friend and our caretaker. And so let's celebrate the fact that Jesus hears our prayers and encourage one another there as our families as we sing together to cast our burdens on the Lord. Let's sing what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer Have we trials temptations is there trouble anywhere Jesus Savior is our refuge take it to the Lord in prayer are we weak and heavy laden cumbered with the load of knows our every weakness, take it to the Lord in prayer. Blessed Savior, you have promised all our burdens you will bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to you in earnest prayer. Soon in glory, bright and clouded, face to face will be our prayer. Joyful praise and endless worship will be our sweet portion Through and 
free trial, my soul will sing, no turning back, I've been set free. Good morning, community. Um, my name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and uh, it's my privilege to lead us this morning in our pastoral prayer. To kind of guide our prayer time together, I just want to read two verses briefly from uh, John chapter 3. This is verses 14 and 15, and this is Jesus alluding back to a story in the Old Testament uh, as the book or as the people of Israel wandered around in the wilderness and sinned against God. And so it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And what Jesus is talking about there is that account in the the book of Numbers about Israel's wandering in the wilderness, where they sinned against God, and as a result, they had snakes come among them uh, to afflict them because of their sin. But God had Moses set up a bronze serpent on a pole, 
and said that if any of the people of Israel lifts their eyes and looks at that serpent, they will be healed. And in the same way, Jesus is saying that anyone who looks to him lifted up, which refers to his being lifted up on the cross, will have healing and forgiveness for all of their sins and all of their afflictions. And so I do not know uh, what you're struggling with today, church, but I know that we serve a God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. That if we look to him in faith, we can find forgiveness for our sins and rest for our souls. And so let's turn our eyes to him in faith and pray to him together this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who was lifted up on the cross for us. Father, we come to you as those who do not have the ability to stand before you on our own. And so we plead Jesus Christ, and we look to him in faith, knowing that his work has been given to us, even though all we have contributed to our relationship with you is our sin. Father, thank you for your grace revealed in Jesus Christ that we can come before you in prayer this morning. Father, I pray that you would be with us as a church. Lord, I pray that you would give us steadfastness and perseverance in doing good works and in loving one another. Father, I know that I am weary of, uh, of a time of not seeing people. I'm weary from the results of of what is going on in our world. And I'd imagine most of us are. So Father, give us the grace to persevere. Help us by your spirit to be encouraged and stirred up for ways that we can be the church to one another. Ways that we can help our brothers and sisters who are in need. And ways that we can encourage one another in a time when we are distant and many of us feeling alone. Father, help all of us as a church to look to Jesus in faith for all of our needs, trusting that he is enough for us. And Father, we do pray that you would give us today our daily bread, that you would provide for your needs, and we would see your faithful provision in our lives as a church. It's in Jesus' name we pray, who lives with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever praised. Amen. Well, this morning, if you would like to give to our church, uh, there's a link below this video. You can click on and go to our online giving page. Uh, We thank you for your generous contributions to our church and continued faithful giving uh, during this time. As well, there's a link down there uh, that you can fill out a form to to send a prayer request to us. Uh, We would love to continue to know what's going on in your life and pray for you. Um, So if you have a prayer request that you'd like to make known to the pastor elders, you can click on that form and fill it out, and we'll get that prayer request and be sure to pray for you. At this time, Noah Verbacek is going to come and read our scripture passage for this morning. Good morning, community. My name is Noah Verbacek, and I have the privilege of reading today's scripture passage for the sermon. Today's sermon comes from Matthew 6, verses 1 through 13. Please follow along as I read aloud. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Well, thank you, Noah, for reading that scripture passage. I'll say this morning, happy Mother's Day to all of you out there. 
uh, especially you mothers and grandmothers. Uh, Mother's Day at church on Sundays is often a, a really sweet time for many. Uh, it's also sometimes a hard time uh, for losses in the past or hurts in the past. And I think we can add this morning not just happy and sad, but also strange, not meeting in person. But it is what it is this morning, and I just wanted to say happy Mother's Day. We're spending the next six weeks teaching through the Lord's Prayer, and the Lord's Prayer divides nicely into six phrases or sentences. This morning, we're going to be taking up the phrase, give us this day our daily bread, from verse 11. We call the series, Lord, Teach Us to Pray, because when Luke introduces this prayer in his gospel account, though we're reading from Matthew, when Luke introduces it, he does so saying that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And the Lord's Prayer is the prayer that he teaches us as his disciples to pray. You might have already noticed this, but I'll highlight it anyway as we begin Like with the Ten Commandments, the beginning of the Lord's Prayer is all about God. First, we begin the prayer by addressing our Father. And it's our Father who is in heaven, the place of power and authority. Like speaking of the president in the Oval Office, heaven is the control room or the command room or the the throne of the universe, so to speak. And we pray that God's name, not ours, would be hallowed. Which is to say, we're praying that God's worth and value and character would be known and esteemed throughout the world. And we pray that his will, not our will, would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which is to say, we pray for justice and equality and peace to abound in God's kingdom on earth the way that peace and justice abound where God dwells in heaven. These are lofty prayers, but they're the kind of prayers that we might expect to be told to pray. If we're praying to God, we should spend time praying about God, how wonderful and how great he is. But some of you, if you're honest, you might be tempted to think that these are the only sorts of prayers that we're supposed to pray. The only kinds of prayers that count, the only kinds of prayers that have the Father's ear are those that are prayers about Him, that is overtly about Him. But not so. Jesus tells us to pray about our needs, our struggles, our temptations, and our fears. The first three clauses in the Lord's Prayer are about the Lord, but the next three are about us. Many in the early church were so dumbfounded that God would ask us to pray about not just Him, but about our needs, that they would take this phrase here about praying for our daily bread, and they turned it so that it would be about the Lord's Prayer. They really, excuse me, about the Lord's Supper. They were allegorizing it. So for the first several centuries and then on almost for a thousand as the Latin translation of the Bible called the Vulgate was used heavily, almost we should say exclusively, it made in this verse, Matthew 6, 11, um, overt in its interpretation that daily prayers for bread were about the Lord's Supper. And in the 1500s, John Calvin came along and said of those early allegorical interpretations, this is exceedingly absurd. (laughs) In other words, the point being, as shocking as it is, God cares about our needs. God wants to hear them. As the conversation about the coronavirus has consumed media and much of our daily conversations, we've been told to wash our hands many times, haven't we? And along with that, we've also been told not to touch our face. Whatever we're doing, you know, blowing our nose or just frankly touching our face, we're told not to do that. And I think many of us, as we've been told not to do that, we've become aware of how often we're actually doing that. When we're told not to touch our face, we realize how often we are actually touching our face. And I bring this up because in a similar way, when we're told to pray for daily bread, 
It also makes us aware of something, not touching our face per se, but aware of our sin. Specifically, as we pray for daily bread, that prayer exposes our boasting, our ingratitude, and our selfish individualism. Let me say a few things about each of these. Praying for daily bread exposes our boasting. What do I mean? A month ago, a politician was speaking at a press conference about flattening the curve, this, you know, the, the, related to the rate of infection and our efforts and how they were working to flatten the curve. And the politician said, God didn't do that. We did that. We flattened the curve by our lockdowns. We did it by our doctors and our policy makers and our scientists. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. And then he said, if I want to lose five pounds, I eat less and exercise more. I have a calorie deficit. Then I, when I do that, I make myself lose weight. God didn't, doesn't do that. I do. And we are the ones flattening the curve. Again, I'm paraphrasing. But what do you think about that? And what does that have to do with praying for daily bread? Well, in some ways, the politician is right. We do have to do stuff. The prayer about daily bread wasn't a prayer made by a lazy farmer who expected his crops to plant themselves and harvest themselves. We do that. We study for exams. We pull a calorie deficit when we want to lose weight. We clock in at the office. We have to do the laundry. We write, or I write, a sermon. But this purely secular analysis, we and we alone did that, is superficial. It doesn't press deep enough. The we and we alone did that, at its heart, is sinful boasting. Consider consider this passage from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is giving God's people instruction before God was to give them the promised land. And right after Moses said that man doesn't live by bread alone, God reminds through Moses his people not to, when they get into the promised land, to go about boasting as though they brought all this prosperity about themselves. Moses tells them in Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 and 18, Beware, lest you say in your heart, By my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it was he who gave you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Verse 18 is the one I want to key on. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. If we flatten the curve, where did we get the ingenuity to do that? How did medicine progress over the last 150 years to the place where we could think about medicine and sickness so wisely? Who has prospered America in such exceptional ways? Well, we work hard and we work smart. Sure, many Americans do work hard and smart. But where does that ability come from? Why is your heart beating right now? Who is it that's giving your brain brain waves? Who provides your lungs with air? A pandemic should show us how fragile we are, not how independent we are. In the New Testament, we read of business leaders who were arrogantly boasting about the way they would go and do such and such and make such and such a profit. And the planning and the profit were not the problems. We should plan and profit is good. The problem was the arrogance that assumes you keep the world spinning. The passage I'm talking about comes from James chapter 4. And right after his critique, he asks this question to these arrogant leaders and really all faithful Christians. He says, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? 
You are but a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Jesus teaches us to pray for daily bread as a reminder that unless God is the one who provides, we are without hope. Praying for daily bread also exposes our ingratitude. What do I mean by this? I think ingratitude is a sin we don't preach about much. Evangelical churches are known for our discussions of sins that are supposedly more flagrant, at least in the way that we conceive of them. But what of ingratitude? Each day, God gives you life and breath and health and shelter and food and much, much more. And yet we rarely, if ever, say thank you. And when we do say thank you, how often is it not in meaningful ways? It's like if each morning I woke up and came downstairs and just took off the kitchen table a hundred dollars that was just left there and I took it and went about the day spending it on the mortgage and food and other things, never stopping to ask, how did this money get here? Where does air come from? Where does rain and sun that come to grow crops, where does that come from? Did the air fairy bring air? Or does the sun fairy and the rain fairy provide those things? I think praying for One of Jesus' intentions in inviting us to pray for daily bread is to expose our ungratefulness. Praying for daily bread also exposes our selfish individualism. What do I mean? Notice that it says, our daily bread. Just as the passage says, our Father, and give us, and forgive us, and then later, lead us, and deliver us. Here I'm reminded of something Ben said as he was and we were preaching through the book of Acts last fall. It's not that the church is like a family. We are a family. We are a family because we have one father, our father. And the prayer for us to ask God to give us a daily bread should cause us to think not only about our needs for daily bread, it's a call to remember the needs of others, our brothers and sisters. Is there someone you know who needs help right now? There are 1.8 million Pennsylvanian citizens who do not have work right now. Will you pray for them? Will you send a text message to the ones that you know? And after church is over, after watching this video, who do you need to call? I think if you let yourself for a moment and and you ask the Lord to help you think about this, I'm sure the Lord would bring someone to mind. And I would just love for this Sunday and this sermon to to kind of be this thing that starts a tidal wave of care across our congregation and our community. And going back to where I started, when we're told not to touch our face, I think we realize how quickly, oh man, I do that often. I think in the Lord's Prayer, specifically even in this phrase, we realize how quickly we have physical and spiritual needs that ultimately, at their deepest extent, we can't satisfy. And we can't provide. We are a mist that appears and vanishes. And praying for our daily bread should cause us to realize how much we need God. But that's not all we should realize. As we pray for daily bread, we also become aware of God's daily grace. I'll say it another way. Praying for daily bread deepens our relationship with the baker, the one who provides daily bread. Look with me again at verses 7 and 8 in Matthew chapter 6. We read Jesus saying, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. 
Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Some people read these verses in isolation from their broader context. They read these verses and make the logical leap that prayer is a waste of time. Why pray when God already knows what we need? What kind of cruel God would know we need something and then demand to ask, be asked before he'll give it? Now there's certainly a logic to that conclusion. But that view of God as cruel can only come if you put your hands on the rest of the Bible and only look at verse 8. Praying for daily bread is not the demand of a cruel God. It's his invitation to be in relationship daily and moment by moment with the baker, the one who loves us and cares for us, He's not a bread fairy content to provide and then be ignored. And that's good for us. Because better than getting daily bread is knowing the baker. The one who wants to know you and wants us to know him. God invites you to share your struggles with him. Are you hurting for friendships? If that's a daily need for you, then pray. Tell God about that struggle. He wants to hear it. Are you hurting for money? Maybe your business has been curtailed in this season. Pray. God wants to know about that struggle or whatever struggle you might have. When we pray for daily bread, we get to know the baker. We get to know how cheerful of a giver he is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Paul, as he's instructing the church about giving tithes and offerings, he says this, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Have you ever thought about why? Why does God love a cheerful giver? It's because cheerful giving reminds the world of Him. God loves to give. In fact, the religious leaders set themselves up in opposition to God. It looks like they're in league with God. They they love God, so it seems, but they're praying to God. They're talking about God. They're, in a sense, giving to God, but they're doing all of that for them. God is not at all a part of that. And they prayed, and they fasted, and they gave, and they did it all so that people would love them. And God is so kind that he even gives his enemies what they want. Twice in this passage we read that they receive their reward in full, verses 2 and 5. God let them have it. And if God will do all that for his enemies, people putting on a show, feeding and clothing and answering the longings of hearts of the lost, how much more will he give cheerfully to his children? If Jesus died for our sins, taking our punishment, and then rose again, and he ascends to the throne of the universe, and his faithful children come to their father asking for help, how much more will God the Father and Jesus intercede and the Holy Spirit work on our behalf in a delightful way to give us our daily bread, whatever our daily bread is that we need? God is a cheerful, happy, delighted giver. My youngest son is almost three. Recently, he's taken to helping me walk out to the car in the morning as I head to work. And he loves to take from me the coffee mug I'm holding and and take it and walk it to the car and I open up the car door and he sort of climbs up uh, almost and sometimes often spilling and put the coffee cup in the cup holder in the car before I head to work. And I, I love to let him do that with me. And the other morning it was raining and he was in his socks. And so I'm walking out the door and he starts yelling at me and and wanting to help. And so (laughs) I hand him my coffee 
mug and he holds it out and I stand behind him and pick up him (laughs) and I walk him out to the car and I sort of put him under one arm and open the car door and then put him back and he navigates standing on my car seat and gets it uh, you know sort of dirty with his feet a little bit and sets the cup holder in and I I walk him back I love that I love doing that terribly inefficient (laughs) but I think that's what God does. If you look in chapter 7, just a few verses into chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, you see that God calls himself a good father who loves to give his children good things. It says that when we ask for bread, he, do, or he doesn't give us a stone. When we ask for an egg, he doesn't give us a snake. As you and I pray for daily bread, we learn to pray with humility, not arrogance. We pray and we learn to pray with thanksgiving, not ingratitude. And we pray for others, not selfishly. But we also pray knowing that if we are Christians, our Heavenly Father is a cheerful giver who loves to help us. Let's spend a few moments closing by praying to our Heavenly Father. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that our needs are not a burden to you in the sense that we often perceive it. It's in fact our needs and our dependence that as we give it to you and you supply our needs with your utter independence, your utter abounding in resources, as you supply our need and our lack and meet our dependence with your independence, you show yourself strong. In fact, the scriptures tell us that you exalt yourself to show us mercy. Lord, we thank you for that. I pray this morning that we would be emboldened to pray to you And we would know the happiness of knowing the one who provides as you meet our needs and more so. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten and beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me.
hear these words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 as you go today. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Thanks and have a great day. Well, for a few minutes here, let's um, talk about Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, which says, give us this day our daily bread. It's a prayer that Jesus, or it's part of a larger prayer, but not that large, that Jesus taught his followers to pray. Here's the beginning. Why don't you just take for a minute um, and, and just two questions for you. The first is this, if you had to eat one food every day for the rest of your life, what would that food be? Spend a few minutes talking about that, or maybe rather than just one piece of food, maybe you can give one, if it was only literally one piece, but then if it was one meal, you can give both answers. Um, The other thing to talk about would be um, a time in your life when you felt like um, something really great happened through you or around you, or you were just involved in something really neat that happened. Talk about that for a few minutes. Well, I hope you were able to talk about what food you would enjoy eating if you had to eat one food every day for the rest of your life. There was a time in my life when... um, I had all these weird issues with food, and to some degree, I still have them, although um, they're still weird and annoying, but they're a lot more clear about what I can eat and not eat. But there was a time when I had to eat just very strict diet. It was um, quinoa and a lot of peanut butter and rice and some crackers, and it was miserable. Um, I think if our family... Uh, which we actually had for dinner last night, was Chipotle. If we could eat one meal as a family for the rest of our lives, it would probably be uh, meals that we could get from Chipotle. I think this prayer about daily bread, though, isn't necessarily about one meal every day for the rest of your life. That is bread being bread, whether toasted or sourdough or whatever. Daily bread is a stand-in for all the things that we need to go about life. Jesus is inviting us to come to him and ask um, whatever we need to do the things we need to serve him and love him and others and go about our lives. And so hopefully you had a moment to think about times in your life when something really neat happened. Um, I can think of those in my own life. But I hope that as you think about those great things that happened, if you think about them long enough, you begin to realize even though you played a part in that, There was a whole bunch of things that were happening outside of your control that made it wonderful. And behind all those things, whether they were people or these chance, so to speak, circumstances, God was moving. If not in kind of ways that were really clear, certainly he was the one giving you breath so that you could breathe and causing your heart to uh, beat and your brain waves. He was giving us the ability to run fast and jump high or do well on an exam or to just have fun and play. And I think this prayer about daily uh, bread is a way for us to be reminded that God is the one who gives us everything. And the Bible says, um, would describe God as a cheerful giver. He doesn't give begrudgingly. In fact, when we give him our deepest problem, namely our sin, he delights to solve that problem in forgiveness that comes through Jesus. You know, I just want to mention real quick as we close, if you're there at a home with uh, your mom or or if if grandma is someone you could call on the phone, maybe it'd be a time when you could just talk about things that you appreciate, the good gift that um, the Lord has given you and having a mother around and in your life and you can do that no matter how old you are Uh, and if your mom's not around where you can give thanks for her perhaps you can just give thanks to the Lord Uh, thanks for watching and we'll see you next week